spoilers for all these things. It's not my fault if you didn't watch them. Huh. <sighs> how did we get here? Or rather, how did I get here? Have I really gotten this low on video ideas? I mean, Steven Universe? What's next? Am I gonna talk about Rick and... Oh, yeah. I, am. Um, I already did that. You know what, whatever, Steven Universe has a moment in it that messes up a concept we see in entertainment media a lot, and I want to talk about it, so first of all, what's, what's going on here? Well, Steven Universe is a cartoon about a 13-year-old boy with the powers of his mom who, like the rest of her group, the Crystal Gems, are aliens from a dictatorship known as the Gem Intergalactic Army. Steven's mom, Rose Quartz, and a group of ragtag warriors saw the practices their homeworld used on other planets, such as systematically genociding the species living on them to make room for new gems to get formed in the foundations of said planets, eventually draining them of all life, and chose to take a stand. After their fight was over, those that remained decided to stay on Earth as its protectors against any other gym-based attacks, and after thousands of years of doing just that, Rose met a human and gave birth to Steven, who inherited her gym and all the powers that came along with it, including a shield, bubble, and other abilities. Much of the series, aside from Steven going on adventures against corrupted gems, clashing with homeworld gems, and getting control over his powers, is about him and the rest of the crew discovering who Rose really was as a person, since she had to give up her own physical form for Steven and can't say so herself. I won't begin Getting too deep into that subplot other than when necessary, but the point of me explaining that all is to help understand who the character Steven currently is stabbing and why she came around in the first place. This is Bismuth, and she was the resident blacksmith for Rose's army. She made all the tools, crafted the weapons, and helped out with strategies until, seemingly randomly, she disappeared. Steven never knew about her because, well, no one ever felt the need to bring her up, but after he found a gem bubbled in a place Rose used to hide things, bubbling is when a gem is kept from regaining their physical form by containing them in a bubble, it's almost like she never left. The gems are ecstatic to see her back, and Steven is excited to learn about her, but as the episode goes on, it starts becoming clearer that Bismuth is just a tad bit aggressive. And while Steven is able to brush it all off at first, he can't any longer when Bismuth shows him a weapon she created called the Breaking Point, something meant for the explicit purpose of shattering gems, and more specifically, the diamonds. The dictator's responsible for all the tyranny and death the gem race has brought to other planets. However, Steven isn't on board with this, and in his exact words, he asks Bismuth, Shattering gems... Wouldn't that make us the same as Homeworld? And I want to plainly say without a shadow of a doubt, no. And while the episode may say the answer is yes, I don't think that's the case at all. But to get to the core of why it doesn't work, I need to explain the trope the writers are utilizing. That being, as I like to call it, the argument from goodness trope. But while I'm talking about things falling apart, did you know that two out of three guys suffer from male pattern baldness after 35? It's a real problem that a lot of men have to face in their daily lives, and often they don't have a way to keep it from happening. I know I've stressed about the idea of losing mine if my family's anything to go by, but if you've seen the signs and want to stop it from getting worse, what do you say to giving this video sponsor Keeps a shot? Basically, what the team over at Keeps does is send you a clinically proven, doctor-recommended subscription crate for hair loss prevention, and even the chance of hair regrowth if you catch it early. And for those that aren't balding and just want to take care of their hair, Keeps is for them as well, with a plethora of strengthening products from shampoo to conditioner. And with their 24-hour line of professionals whenever you need them, they can help determine the very best plan for you. So, what sounds better? Going through the hassle of a doctor's appointment for way too much money, or getting to know exactly what you need at the click of a button? Hair loss stops with Keeps, and if it sounds good to you, to get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash just stop, or go to the link in the description. That's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash j-u-s-t-s-t-o-p. Thanks to Keeps for sponsoring, and back to the video. Video. Let me set a scene for you. Protagonist Jones has defeated the big bad of the story and is one blow or drop or whatever away from killing him. But what's that? Side character A shouts aloud, No, protagonist Kuhn, don't do it. If you do it, you'll be just like him. The just like him part being in reference to the act of killing out of a need for revenge. Making it morally on the same level as killing or whatever the antagonist did and turning the protagonist into what they despise, a villain. That's not the only context this situation is used in, but for sure it's the most prominent. And that's clearly what Steve universe is going for with this portrayal of bismuth. She's so swept up in the emotions of the moment that she doesn't realize what her killing the diamonds would imply, and Steven wants to stop her from doing it. Yet the scene, when taken into context, doesn't work at all. Why? Well, to tell you as much, first I want to go through a few examples of situations where the trope is used effectively, then at the end I'll compare it to Steven's logic and how it doesn't hold up. First up, the death of Envy in the anime Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. I won't go too far into explicit detail on all these situations just for the sake of brevity, but to sum up what's going on in this scene, the character about to kill is an alchemist in the army by the name of Colonel Roy Mustang, who uses the lost art of flame alchemy to snap his fingers and literally blow any enemy he sees away in a grand explosion. The character he's intending to kill is Envy, a 
being made from the lives of several hundred people called a homunculus, so in order to kill him, you'd have to do it over and over again until he ran out. Mustang wants to kill Envy in an overtly painful way to avenge the death of his close friend, Emmaus Hughes, who was killed by Envy while trying to relay information to Mustang over the phone. Internally, Mustang has kept this death close to his heart ever since it happened, and throughout the series has pursued the killer until finally finding it to be Envy, who not only killed Hughes, but took on the form of his wife to do it, making the revelation sting all the more for Mustang, who knew Hughes valued his wife and young daughter over everything else. In the heat of the moment, Envy tries to play to Mustang's love for Hughes by shapeshifting into him, but that only fuels Mustang's anger, as he's accepted the death of Hughes, but not of vengeance, and after Envy almost did the same to his lieutenant and love interest, Riza Hawkeye, there's nothing but pure malicious intent in his eyes. In a beautifully animated scene, Mustang continues firing snap after snap, burning Envy as he tries to taunt Mustang until all he can do is scream in pain, but before he can deliver the final blow, who else but Hawkeye decides to stop him, and it isn't quite for the reason you'd expect. Rather than out of a basic mentality like, you'll be the same as him, Hawkeye as well as main character Edward Elric and former antagonist Scar all posit that if Mustang kills Envy for the sake of vengeance instead of duty, that final blow will make it impossible for him to remain a person ruled by reason instead of hate, and if he wants to take over the country as its new leader, he can't be that way. They aren't saying Envy shouldn't die because they all know he has to, but if that's going to happen, it can't be Mustang that delivers the final blow. It's an idea grounded in logic, character, and Hawkeye's mixed feelings of love and respect for Mustang as a person, not wanting him to fall down a path he can never return from. She knew the moment was coming from the time he started showing rage towards other homunculus earlier in the series, and she wanted to stop him from becoming something she knew he was better than. This, like the rest of Fullmetal Alchemist, is a brilliantly implemented usage of a common trope. And other characters have had a similar sentiment in mind, not killing because of the mental toll and irreversibility of the action. Batman has had the chance to kill the Joker on multiple occasions, and there are plenty who would say it's the best option to stop him from breaking out of Arkham again, but he doesn't do it for a simple reason. Killing the Joker would mean he'd won, that all Batman stood and fought for was meaningless, his symbol would be tainted, meaning he could never go back, and it's not the only way to be effective under those circumstances. Case 2, Avatar The Last Airbender. In a world originally separated into four nations, making up groups of people that can bend the elements of water, earth, fire, and air, everything becomes unbalanced when the Fire Nation begins a hostile takeover of the others, decimating the water tribes, attempting to slither into the ranks of the Earth Kingdom, and completely killing off the Air Nomads, making many wonder why the Avatar, master of all four elements, who reincarnates each time the next dies, wasn't able to come in and stop it. Turns out, due to the, at the time, new Avatar Aang's reluctance to take on the hefty responsibility of the job, he fled and, after getting caught up in a massive storm, instinctually throws himself along with his flying bison in a giant mound of ice, only getting discovered 100 years later by two wandering remnants of the Water Tribe and learning he has to stop the new Fire Lord Ozai in a year before he's given the powers of a comet that will make his takeover of the world all too possible, and to do that, he has to learn every element and prepare to kill him. But unfortunately for basically everyone, Aang doesn't want to kill Ozai, and that's rooted in his belief as a nomad, strongly opposing violence of any kind, and in particular the act of murder, which becomes a major conflict of his character as the day gets closer. In a way, it's sort of similar to Steven's case, coming from a place of moral opposition, but while Steven's is solely based on the most basic ideas of what makes good and evil, Aang's is much more complex. He learns about how his people and all he knew were obliterated by the Fire Nation, he sees how they've subjugated and enslaved those that would fight against them, and he knows what Ozai is willing to do to get what he wants, even if it's scarring his only son and banishing him from the land to look for the Avatar. But Aang's beliefs hold strong, and he can't find it in himself to kill Ozai, no matter how much of a bitch he is. The difference between Aang and Steven is that he does believe deep down that Ozai may need to be killed to stop the tyranny, but it conflicts with his own personal conviction, and to him, no matter how right that statement might be for everyone else, he wants to find a way around it. When the day gets really close, Aang starts looking for any way to back out, and calls on the Avatars of the past to ask them what he should do, thinking they'll agree with him, but they don't. All of them, including a fellow Air Nomad, agree that the Avatar's duty is to protect others and it precedes any personal feelings, so if he allows them to get in the way, Aang and all his friends could die. There's no secondary person telling Aang that he shouldn't kill Ozai, in fact it's to the contrary, a rare instance in one of these situations. So what happens when the battle between Aang and Ozai inevitably comes to a closing point? Ozai is down on his knees and Aang is faced with a choice he so dreaded having, and in that moment it seemed he only had one option, Aang sought out another, performing a process to take away Ozai's bending rather than 
and kill him. It's a process that nearly takes Aang's own soul over as he does, but just barely he wins out, and by doing so, restores the balance that was originally so thrown off by Ozai in the first place. And in the moment, it displays another clear difference to Steven Universe. While Aang is able to get rid of the powers of the Fire Lord, a physical trait that can be taken away and therefore stop his tyranny, it's impossible to take down the diamonds and their fleets without killing them. This isn't how Steven Universe goes, and again, that only adds to how badly they implemented the trope. But to close up on Avatar, Aang's action is again a culmination of all the series stands for. Balance, idealism, and the idea that not all situations are as cut and dry as they seem. The latter two being attempted by Steven Universe and falling flat in their execution of the moral argument between Steven and Bismuth. To put it bluntly, the trope of argument from goodness isn't applicable from the broad scale of that would make you just like them when the antagonist is too terrible for that to work. The diamonds aren't one-off murderers or ignorant of their own actions or a byproduct of some oppressive system. They are the oppressive system. They've conquered countless worlds, killed no doubt billions, possibly trillions of intelligent life forms they considered inferior. They've built fascistic regimes enforcing a strict hierarchy determining how gyms will function. And if they don't stay in line, they'll be shattered. They command fear and dominance against anyone that opposes them. Overall, not exactly the most easily redeemable people. As stated, their powers aren't external like Ozai, they're figurative as well as physical. The power they hold in the armies they control is far greater than any ability they might be able to harness, so finding a way to take their abilities isn't going to help. If Steven wants to stop their reign, he and the gems need to shatter them. Only then will the power they hold be able to disperse. Only then will the brainwashed masses of their capital listen to reason. It's hilarious that Steven would ever humor the idea that killing the diamonds would put Steven and co on the same level as them. No, not just funny, it's absolutely moronic. Wouldn't it make us just as bad? Well, tell me, Steven, how many planets have you genocided? Because unless it's in the quadruple digits, I don't think it's all too comparable when thinking about the good killing the diamonds could do. Have you forced your disobedient subjects' corpses to merge their shattered souls together in some giant abomination of a being enraptured in total suffering for thousands of years? Better yet, have you been implied to have done that more than once? Because if so, I might need to question your status as the main character or any kind of moral authority. But no, Steven is right because he is the main character, and that's the message the writers want to go for, no matter how much it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And dear God, they try to make Bismuth more in the wrong by portraying her as angry and aggressive, but after all she's gone through, I'm not sure any less would be expected. Like, how's Steven gonna fix this? Fucking talk to the genocidal sadistic maniacs and get him to say sorry? That's, um, that's exactly what they did. Just gonna get up for a second. Are you fucking shitting me? After cornering themselves with the message of shattering the diamonds isn't the answer bullshit, the only other option the writers of Steven Universe could come up with to solve their issue was by talking it out and telling the space Gestapo it's okay to have flaws. This is a problem with setting up a clear image of characters and not having the foresight to create a satisfactory conclusion. Like, imagine if Aang decided his best course of action was to talk to the Fire Lord instead of killing him or taking away his bending. Hey Ozai. I know you ordered the genociding of my people and want to perform some kind of ethnic cleanse, but come on, man. You're just a person. You got feelings, man. You gotta, you gotta let them out. Let's hug it out, big guy. Come on. Ah! Oh, this was a terrible mistake. I made a severe and continuous lapse of my judgment. Oh my God, Jesus. Fuck! That's what should have happened, but it didn't. Steven Universe wanted to be the last airbender. It wanted to share this idea that violence didn't have to be the answer. But it had none of the build-up. Steven's moral conviction was impersonal and weakly based. The death of the diamonds wouldn't be the mark of any significant change for his character, considering he knows jack shit about them other than their atrocities. There's nothing significant to give the audience an impression that his decision made sense in any context beyond the vague idea the writer's belly flopped on so hard it broke the fucking sound barrier. In a way, at one point after figuring out Rose is one of the diamonds, they try to begrudgingly backpedal by bringing Bismuth back and saying, Hey, there's a reason my mom's plan didn't make sense. But Steven, you had the same idea without the excuse. Where's your reason for being an idiot, huh? The trope can be done excellently under the right circumstances. Steven just swung and missed. But some critics didn't explain their opinion as well, so I remember hearing some people being like, Man, isn't it funny that haters get mad in an episode saying we shouldn't kill people we disagree with? And it's like, no. Shut your mouth. Be quiet. You've lost speaking privileges, and I am not giving them back. This is the only Steven Universe content you're ever gonna get out of me, so I hope it was worth it. I'll see you in the next video where I whine about children's media and genocide. I don't know, I picked some random ass topics that could be sooner than you think.